here at NRA headquarters with Phil Schreier, senior curator of the NRA Firearms Museum, one of the premier firearms museums. And Phil, we, we talked about when we were on the road in Albuquerque for the National Police Shooting Championships, starting a new feature, since we love to have you on the program, and, and folks on nranews.com and Sirius Patriot 144 love to hear folks talk about firearms, and they love to see them and hear them, and, and, and as far as I'm concerned, Phil, you're the best guy to do this. So we talked about launching a new feature, and we're launching it here at NRA, and we're going to make this into a regular weekly feature. We're calling it the Curator's Corner. You're going to come on and tell us about a particular firearm, talk a little bit about what's going on in the museum. I'm very excited about this, so let's get started. Tell us, Phil, what you brought in for this uh, premiere edition, of, if you will, of uh, the Curator's Corner. Well, the premiere edition uh, for today, we have just a simple old Colt 38 caliber double action revolver. Uh, but this particular piece is, uh, is pretty neat. Uh, it's only 12 digits off from a, uh, a, a identical Colt revolver marked and stamped the exact same way that was issued to the United States Navy back in 1896. Uh, Colt's uh, you know, Colt was famous for pretty much inventing the, the revolver as we know it today. Uh, in 1836, he came out with his first revolvers. Uh, Colt had always felt that a single action gun, a gun that you just cocked the hammer, it stayed cocked until you pulled the trigger and then it fell, was the best way of, uh, of shooting a gun. It was more accurate. Uh, but after he died, trying to compete with some of the European designs, they finally came out with what we call now a double action revolver, where you can not only cock it and stabilize the gun and fire it, but you can just pull the trigger and the cylinder will rotate and cock and make the hammer fall all by itself. So the United States Navy was interested in this new feature, and they started to contract with Colt for these in 1892. And this particular gun, as same with the gun that's 12 digits away from it, uh, are both marked and inspected by U.S. Navy inspectors. And they have a great big naval anchor on it. It says USN and has the initials of the inspector on it. Uh, and the neat thing about this gun uh, is that uh, there, its cousin, we'll call it, uh, was uh, recovered on the uh, 16th of February, 1898 in Havana Harbor, in about 40 feet of water. Uh, that's because the night before, at 9.38 p.m., the USS Maine, while well, docked at mooring buoy number four, exploded, lifted up out of the water, and then sank, killing 266 U.S. sailors and Marines. Uh, when the cable was sent from the American Embassy from Havana to Key West, the closest point of land in the United States, uh, that the Maine had been blown up in the harbor, uh, the duty officer of the time was a guy named Commander William S. Cowles. And he commandeered the USS Raleigh and uh, put her to sea and made the 90-mile trip from Key West to Havana to become the first American warship on the scene to uh, assist in the rescue effort of the wounded sailors. Uh, he sent divers down on the uh, main immediately uh, because there was such high tension between the government of Spain, the U.S. government, and Cuban rebels on the island of Cuba that wanted freedom uh, for their people, it wasn't determined. As, uh, it wasn't known immediately as to how or why the main was blown up. So he sent divers down on the main, and they went to Captain Sigsby's cabin uh, to find out if the keys to the powder magazines were still locked safely in his cabin. If the keys were still there. Then it was an external force that blew up the main. The keys were missing, then it was an internal job. Inside job. That's right. Yeah. So uh, the divers went down, all the keys were where they were supposed to be. It was immediately ruled out that it was internal sabotage. And one of the divers found this Colt 38 caliber double action with all the Navy ish issue and inspector stamps on it in the, uh, in the cabin of the main and brought it and gave it to Cowles. Cowles immediately departed Cuba for Washington, D.C., where he gave a report to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. 
and on the sinking of the Maine, the, the first preliminary report as to what had happened. Now, this blowing up of a U.S. naval warship directly led to the United States declaring war on Spain and her empire in April of that same year. Uh, when that happened, the assistant secretary of the Navy that had received uh, oh, I'm, Cal's gave this pistol to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, kind of as a souvenir trophy of the Maine. Right. Uh, he was uh, just happened to be related to him. He was his brother-in-law, so it was something that would you do for a brother-in-law. You give him a gun. So right. uh, he got this gun off the Maine. Well, when we declared war in April, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy went to the President, offered his resignation from the Cabinet post and uh, accepted a commission as a colonel of volunteer cavalry. Mm -hmm. It was known as the 1st U.S. Volunteer Cavalry. And as colonel of this regiment, it was then called Roosevelt's Rough Riders. And Theodore Roosevelt took that same 38 caliber pistol, put it in his holster, and on the morning of July 1st, 1898, led his men up Kettle Hill and then San Juan Hill, and took both hills from the Spanish and won the day for the United States. And nearly, uh, well, actually a little over 100 years later, uh, in a ceremony at the, uh, in the White House, in the Roosevelt Treaty Room in the White House, Roosevelt Room. Uh, the Roosevelt family was finally presented the Medal of Honor on behalf of Theodore's actions and what he called that morning his crowded hour. Wow, that's neat. What a great piece of history. And it's this pistol's cousin is here at the National Farms Museum, and that's the kind of history that the, the, the farms in this museum are steeped in history. There's so many things which I'm so excited about. We're just scratching the surface here uh, of, of what's to be found here, and we're looking forward to talking to you more about getting great glimpses on, on some of the neat items that are over there. Tell us a little more, a, a little bit about how people can get information on the National Farms Museum, because it's neat to watch the video or hear this on Sirius Satellite Radio, but when you're in the D.C. area, you got to get here to the museum in Fairfax. Well, we appreciate that. The museum is located right off of Interstate 66. Uh, it's just 12 miles uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, we're right outside what they call the Capitol Beltway, or 495. Uh, the intersection of Route 50, which goes from Ocean City, Maryland, all the way to California. And uh, we uh, are open 10 to 4 seven days a week uh, and if you can't make it to the museum you can find us on the web at, uh, at nrahq.org or nationalfirearmsmuseum.org and uh, there's a virtual tour available online Great, and thank you, Phil, for this virtual. The great story and a piece of history here to launch the uh, Curator's Corner. Phil Schreier, Senior Curator here at the National Farms Museum out at NRA Headquarters. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you.